My first show I started at the Get Me High Lounge. It was a Monday night poetry reading before the Green Mill started. I did that for a couple years and I formed an ensemble group called the Chicago Poetry Ensemble. We had done some shows at Dave Gemelos, who is the owner of the Green Mill. We had done some shows at his other club, the Deja Vu on Lincoln Avenue. I asked him, because I knew he wasn't gonna do any jazz on Sundays, I asked him if we could have a chance to do a poetry variety show on Sunday nights. And he said, yeah. So we started July 20th, 1986, a month after Dave bought the club, and we've been there ever since. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Here you are at the Slam. Folks, this is a Slam. There's Slams all over the world now. I used to say that, it was a big lie, but now it's the truth. There's Slams in Berlin, Jerusalem, Kalamazoo, Peoria. They all started here. I'm the guy who started them all. My name is Mark Smith. So what? What makes the slam different than an ordinary poetry reading? You, the audience, are always in control. If you happen to like something, you cheer madly. But that's not what has made the slam poet strong. It's the other stuff. If you don't like it a little bit, you snap your fingers. That's not dig me, daddy Oh, those guys are dead. This is a new regime here. If you don't like it a little bit more, you stomp your feet. If it's god awful bad, you groan. What makes a slam work is that it's a new form. It's a new form of presenting poetry. And when you work with form, when you create a new form, well then you're really doing something. And if the slam continues to inspire poets to break off from the old and create new, well, then I think we're on the right path. This is the open mic. The first set is always the open mic. And uh, we're going to start off from the famous fishbowl. And it's going to be Bob Chico, everybody, the beer vendor poet. You may recognize this guy. That's because you see him at the ballpark all the time. This is about the uh, recent litigation about the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. This is for uh, everyone who has waited for the results of an HIV test. This is for bald people everywhere. <laughs> the difficulty we are having here is not with the word God, but with the preceding preposition. This blood, which is being drawn for the test, is not familiar blood. I'm not beautiful like you. I'm beautiful like me. The song rages on, bitter against the Barbie cheerleader type. My head's been smooth as a 10-year-old's ass for five years, and I like the way I look. Hail to the cue ball, the comb over, the eye of the hurricane, the widow's peak, and the prince's lay side puffs. Embrace your baldness. Mama used to dance. She used to woo-woo, hit it. She used to freak out and hustle. The attention at the shows, everything that I've done has always been to let everybody in, and young and old. Another great thing about the slams in general across the world is that it's one of the rare places where you're going to have somebody who's 76 years old on an equal level with somebody who's 15 years old. Where does that happen? Look at me. I'm this old guy, 52 years old, and, and I'm, I'm, I go to Switzerland and I'm with kids that are 21 years old and we're sitting at the table as if we're peers, and we are peers. There's no difference. It, it, it just lets everybody be somebody. And I've, I've worked at making it comfortable so that everybody can get up there. Another list, another plan, another draft of who I am, another season, another reason. For writing poetry A lot of words A lot of rhymes The poet's nervous He forgets the fucking lines It's really killing We're all 
was so willing to write this stuff. To the bridge! Now picture a group of poets down by the U of C. Picture that same group of poets standing here next to me, Mark Smith. You see him squirm, they begin to twist. How did they get here, a place like this? <laughs> they make it plain, this ain't their game. Slamming to do this? Sonia is a student. A student of English. Our second judge is Karen. What's her qualification? She is more highbrow than I once knew a man from Nantucket. Our third judge is our virgin virgin from earlier, Bridget. Her friend says that her qualification is that she's human and has two ears and a brain and a heart. Here's the rules. Rule number one, no poem may go over three minutes. You are all timers. If it even feels like three minutes, you start snapping your fingers. Rule number two, listen to the poem. <laughs> That's the joke that isn't funny, but we laugh anyway. Let's try that again. Rule number two, listen to the poem. <laughs> then rate the poem one to 10, 10 being high. However, you may go into the minus numbers. <laughs> the prize is $10. <laughs> And we are gonna start off with Joel Shamara. Here we go. If you want a piece of me, you get the piece with chlamydia. <laughs> because the hand of fate has been down my pants before. It turned all of my questions into one big exclamation point. And with bit flicking quickness, fate and karma tag teamed me, and the result was an assault on the psyche. But then you came along and started to use words like forever. Well, that's a mighty long time. So I'm here to tell you there's something else. The rest of this poem. Well, before the so slam the came along, the, the poets the aspired to the send their poems out to some old, little magazine, which was headed up by some hack editor who uh, held reign over whether the poem was going to be accepted or not. And that's what the poets hung their hopes on, that they just might get accepted and maybe paid $10, maybe paid and copies of a little magazine and uh, that was a big thing I first got published when I was 19 and I thought it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me in my life I drove to Melrose Park to find the publishing company and it was somebody's house in the basement I thought what the hell is this so just take my hand. now for slam perform poets and performance poets, their big thing is to be on the stage. The big thing is they have a crowd of a couple of hundred people get up there, read your poem, and rock the house. Have the have them roar, you know. Not Steve. Where's Steve? Everybody, Steve. Have the audience on, roar. Steve. 
How's it going? All right. I know I forgot my uh, material at home, so I end up writing it down as bar napkin. So bear with me, please. That's a haiku. <clears throat> Helped you move your stuff from your house out to the truck. So now, what the fuck? <laughs> You see, I got a van full of shit I need to move. You're the movies. So then, what the fuck? No, what the fuck, man? What the fuck? Hey, man, what the fuck? I move your golf clubs and move that nasty ass couch and your bitch ass cat. All of your comics, all 30 boxes. And who the hell reads that? Help me move my shit before I take this iron and smash your brains out on the wicker desk that you bought at Ikea, which I also moved. Steve, in his famous poem, what the fuck? What the fuck? What the fuck, man? Steve, how true, everything. And I especially like the, uh, the, uh, the music and the, I'm gonna take the iron and smash your brains out. <laughs> Very poetical. <laughs> what is that, a laugh of mockery that you do around? You know? yes. Is this a competition with us again tonight? No. Are you starting that shit again? Mark, we kind of love you even more. You know. <laughs> I do the jokes, Jonathan. You play the piano. Look at this. This is all about. Oh, shit, I only have $6 tonight. Oh, well. I'll, I'll owe you four, whoever wins. Okay, let's see the scores. Eight. First of all, seven, for the record, seven point I think nine. the competition is a mockery. One, it's all, it's, two point nine. it's been a mockery of American competitive spirit. This is supposed to teach you how silly competition is and how it destroys your art. Because if you're, if you're thinking about getting ahead, your soul's not in it. On the other hand, the people that usually win are people that lose themselves. When you lose yourself in performance, then you're doing it because you've transcended yourself and, and you're usually gonna win. But to, how can somebody get so serious about winning $10? And you, it used to be Twinkies. The prize used to be Twinkies. Like even last Sunday, this guy, the guy he's a great poet, great performance poet. He was in the slam, and he's, he's had great success. He came up to me. I think you added up the numbers wrong. Well, probably, he's probably right, because I, I add them up wrong all the time. Roseanne, come on up here. This is called My Italian Mother. My Italian mother taught me lots of things about life. No matter what the topic, she always had something important to say. For instance, my Italian mother has tips on beauty that would put Cosmo writers to shame. No wear white, you look fat. Change your head, it look like a sheet. How you gonna get a man? My Italian mother thought college was important and had plenty to say. Go to school, find a man, and no spread your legs. No man gonna marry a whore. My Italian mother knows a lot about politics, and she's always ready with wisdom to share. President Bush is a dumbass fuck. <laughs> and worse yet, he not Italian. No marry a man like that. My Italian mother is an authority on relationships and always is ready with a lesson to teach. 
You talk too much, you think too much, and please, not be a bitch or no man is gonna marry you. <laughs> now I'm engaged, and you would think that my Italian mother would be happy about my impending marriage. Why you marry a Jew poet? You know he's gonna be gay in a year. <laughs> advice go for nothing sometimes rosa i swear i don't know what to do with you thank you okay write down your scores on the napkins and hold them up so we can see yeah, that's what the napkins are for i remember one of the great Moments that was just there and gone. I've never seen the people before. This is like maybe 19. Give her a big round of applause. 89. A very, very black man. Very dark skinned black man with a woman that was almost an albino. She was so white. She's dressed in white, he's dressed in black. They came in to the open mic with chains, garbage can lids, bunches of metal junk. I thought, oh my God, what the hell is this? They got that stuff going. Got a rhythm going with all this junk. It was just phenomenal. It was unbelievable. I've never seen them any again. They're like phantoms. Uh, those wonderful moments where people were willing to do things that they they didn't know would succeed. Those chances made the, made the show so exciting because the audience never knew what's going to happen. Next up, Tennessee Mary, Tennessee Mary. How young are you? I am so young. I'm still fascinated by how they make babies and by my own belly button lint. I'm perfectly content to eat a dinner that consists of Kool-Aid, Cracker Jacks, and cigarettes. The way I'm going at this rate next year, I'll be like eight. I am so young. I can go to one of your parties and turn up your speakers, dance around half naked in your living room, eat up all your cheese crackers, grab a bottle of your gin. On my way out the door, when you're all asleep, I will come back for more. I get away with this. Nobody takes me to task for it because I'm still so young. I'm so young, I can go out on a Monday night and match you whiskey for whiskey, start a bar fight, go into work the next morning all hungover with a black eye and a palm print on my cheek and still accomplish more in one day than you did all last week because I'm so full of energy, I'm so full of vitality, I'm still so young. I'm so young, but I can hold my own in conversations about chaos theory and the book of revelations, microbiology and theta philosophy. It's been one year since I got my degree, and last week I turned 23, and that's a lot to have accomplished for somebody so young. I'm so young, I can drop out, quit jobs, skip town, get high, take all the money in my bank account. I guarantee in one day it'll be spent. The money was meant for my bills, right? It was meant for my rent, but my landlord's got a crush on me. He always lets me pay late. Isn't it great to be this young? I'm so young. Self-destruction is still a cute word for me to have in my vocabulary. Somebody pour me a drink, bum me a smoke, and give me a light, because cancer, alcoholism, they're like 30 years away at this point. I still cross my fingers and hold my breath. When I pass graveyards and bookshelves in my house are filled with four-leaf clovers, I don't have one-night stands, man. I have sleepovers. <laughs> I'm still very desirable, right? Because I'm still so young. I'm so young. I can take a love that is pure and true and fuck it up real good and hurt you and hurt you and hurt you and have a pretty good excuse. I got one leg out the window of your house and you grab me and with tears in your eyes you say, stay, Mary, please, baby, baby, please. But I got better things to do than sit here half in this window with you all night and fight so I'm out like a light. I gotta go get busy being young. <laughs> <laughs> 
I am so young, I could move to Amsterdam tomorrow and spend all my money on hookers and blow, and my life in Europe could be real bad, you know, it could be real hard, but you're all just sitting in your living rooms waiting for the next postcard for me to tell you how I'm having so much fun because that's what I'm supposed to be doing because I'm so young, but I'm sorry, and I'm scared, and I'm real confused, but I keep milking this excuse for all it's worth. I keep keeping too much cash in my purse, keep walking into rooms like I own the place, walking into those rooms with egg all over my face, I act like a fool, I get another tattoo, I'm supposed to, when I'm so young. And all you old people, right, you sit around and you work your jobs and you drink your tea, take care of your responsibilities and you tell stories about me and about your own glory days and shit. But I think deep down you'd rather forget, you'd rather forget just how great it is to be this young. Thanks. Tennessee Mary. Tennessee Mary, everybody. You know, I see a lot of people think the slam is just about goofing around and being goofy and everything, but it's really a trick. It's always been a trick. We entertain you to get moments like important moments when somebody's really telling you the truth about stuff and uh, that's the show wouldn't be go going on for 15 years if it wasn't for the fact that we have these moments where we really talk about uh, things of the human human race that's what we are the human race unfortunately we are it you know it might be better if we were dogs or you know but then we get kicked around but, uh, <laughs> like we kick around piano players now and then Let's see the scores. 8.5, 9.5, and a 7.5. Oh, Bridget, you're young too. You like to fuck around. Bridget doesn't care, she's young. She don't care, you're the judge, Bridget, not them. Just because you gotta get from there out the bed doorway over there, I mean, oh, I mean a thing, baby. 24.5. 25.5. Guy just comes to go to the bathroom and tell me I can't add. 25.5. Tennessee Mary wins by three tenths of a point. Oh my God. It's easy to go to the newspapers and pull out ideas. It's much harder to go into your own heart and take out a dark corner of your heart and put that up on the stage for people to see. That really takes courage. But I've been free of the work world. Years, decades, over 12 years. Believe me, I can't go back to working for somebody. I could never do it. I'd be on the street. I'd never work for somebody again. Yeah, I make a humble, a humble living from it, but I'm free. The freedom that I have is well worth worrying about the rent. And there's times that I, one time I sold all my jazz records because I couldn't make a month's rent, you know. I mean, it's pretty pathetic for somebody in their 40s to be doing that, but I don't care. I made, I quit a job that I made a good chunk of change, you know. I was the boss, and I quit that and I don't regret it at all. I wonder if I'm at the end of this. And when I think about that, I think about, I think about two things. I think about having a, a little farmette, and then I also think about fixing up, uh, fixing up the houses, you know, and doing that thing. But not in the city, out in the country. I don't know if I'll, you know, and then I'll go to, then I'll go to the theater and see some piece of theater that's happening, the lights will come on, and I'll think I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna leave this. Because it's magic. It should, it should be a very sacred magic thing. There's something of something around us, within us. A something of something heard sometimes in the sound of one instrument at play. There's a brilliance and a death in each note that vibrates off the string into the wind, into the breath of the wind, like a sigh. 
that precipitates upon our perceptions unnamed, unsolved resolution. Resolution building like white cumulonimbus clouds above city skyline, stone and steel, above platforms and pedestrians, stone walks and fountains, building more mysteriously than the unseen pressure of air that builds on idle sun porch afternoons, where idle music sheets, silent so long upon a silver stand, are overturned by new accords of weather, sounding with every breath, new rattlings, new taps of the branch against the window, new scratchings at the door, begging to be brought in. There's something in the wind, in the music, in the loneliness that carries us back to the cloud's face, to the yellow jacket's chur, to the parting and the convergence, to the dark red rapture within the bones mark. And whatever that something is, contained in the wind, in the music, in the loneliness, it strains against its boundaries to be found, to be free, to be resolute in the storm-bent bending of stems, in the beating rapture of rain, in the vibrations of the strings set to motion by the fingers commanding allegiance from each of the keys as they are played by that something of something around us. everybody. My name's Mark Smith. See you next week. You know, that's the thing I like to tell people about the show is that this is an art that's just passive. This is an art that you go out and buy. This is an art that does nothing. This is art that changes your life. It changed my life. It's changed thousands of people's of lives. And that's what art's supposed to do. It's supposed to change people's lives. them to go into minus numbers and lately not enough people give minus scores. If somebody gets up on stage and says something that you've heard a hundred thousand times already, you should not be giving them positive scores, negative scores. You might think that that's mean, but it's not because usually the poet that gets the negative score, you could fire a bazooka at him and he'd still be reading his poem. Rhyme went out of vogue because everybody started using the same rhymes. We can recognize that in the old forms because you had the whole 19th century when all these bad poets are rhyming. Everybody's rhyming. You had to rhyme to write poems. Thank God free verse comes along and says, no, you don't necessarily have to rhyme. Unfortunately, today, we accept all this crap rhyme that we hear where somebody gets on stage and, and rhymes a T-I-O-N, construction, frustration. You know, you could rhyme the shun rhyme till you die. When Billy had the audacity to stick his little tiny thing into every nasty knot of an old oak tree. That score was awarded by now slam judge famous. You made me blow the fucking line on camera, Alan. Shut the fuck up. Jesus, he's a fucking lawyer, can't ever keep his mouth shut. It's funny how we all assume our roles, you know, like I'll keep on talking and saying stuff. He's, you know, he's not gonna get, you know, we're in the break time and he's on that camera. He's not gonna stop. You got the gun on me. We, we, yeah, that's what, he, all the stuff he's asking me doesn't matter. It's just this shit that's gonna happen. I got it. Uh, you tricky guys, aren't you? How am I gonna be able to talk tonight?
<laughs> I'm so sick of talking.